one, calling the roll for the Monday, June 22nd Board of Control meeting. We have Dale Miller. Dale Miller. Hello. Did um, you call my name? I couldn't hear it very well. Oh, yes. Dale Miller. Can you hear me now? Here. Okay. Nan Baker. Here. Trevor Macular serving as an alternate for Dan Brady. Here. We have Lenora Lockett. Here. Mike Chambers serving as an alternate for Armin Budish. Here. Lee Tucker serving as an alternate for the fiscal officer. Here. Dave Marquard serving as an alternate for Mike Dever. We have a quorum. Okay, at this time, I'll give you an uh, opportunity if anyone has any uh, questions or changes regarding the minutes of June 15th to speak, uh, please speak now. Hearing none, then I will make a motion to approve those minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Marquard. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Public comment. Do we have any public comment? Once, twice, no public comment. Moving on. Contracts and awards? We're moving on to new items. The first new item is item number BC 2020-347, Department of Development. A, submitting an RP exemption, which will result in a payment to Downtown Cleveland Alliance, and the amount is being revised at the request of County Council in the amount not to exceed $100,000 instead of $400,000 for financial assistance to downtown businesses impacted by the recent civil unrest. And it's for the period June 22nd, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. And B, recommending, recommending the payment in the amount of $100,000 in connection with said RP exemption. Good morning, Paul Hertig with the Department of Development and also on the phone this morning is Joseph Marinucci, President of the Downtown Cleveland Alliance. We've provided some written answers to questions from board members. I would just like to briefly state that Cuyahoga County is uh, planning to participate subject to approval of this board as a partner along with the City of Cleveland, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, and Greater Cleveland Partnership in providing assistance to downtown businesses who were impacted by the recent civil unrest. This is something none of us ever wanted to have to deal with, but it's here. We believe that our participation is vital to restoring the public confidence and faith in downtown businesses as they continue to reopen from COVID. And um, we therefore request approval of this, of this payment. And I'm here to answer questions and also Mr. Marinucci to answer questions. Okay, thank you, Paul. Are there any questions from our board members? Hi, this Mr. is Chair. Dale. Sure, Dale. I have one question. And uh, my question is that, that does it, the description suggests we're going to be focusing on uh, businesses that have uninsured losses, which certainly makes sense, but I'm wondering whether uh, whether this will uh, reward businesses for not buying insurance, and, and uh, just wondered your comments on the, uh, on the impact of that. This is Paul, and I will turn in a moment to Mr. Marinucci for greater insight on, on the economics of downtown small businesses. I want to thank um, the council member for the question and also for the opportunity to give it a few moments thought before the meeting. My opinion here is that this, this damage, this civil unrest was not something that anyone foresaw. If businesses had failed to insure against fire or other routine kinds of losses and then came to us for a grant, I would have a very different opinion. But this, we, I believe, was an unanticipated event that, that really nobody saw coming. And I would defer to Mr. Marinucci for any further insight. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, Councilperson Miller, uh, I would add that um, we spoke uh, with about 75 uh, companies uh, or small businesses, excuse me, that were impacted um, by the civil unrest. 
Um, what we do know is, uh, although the majority of them did have insurance, uh, a few of them, especially the smaller ones, the, the more the micro-sized ones, uh, had their insurance lapse uh, during the COVID situation. Um, if you could think about it, uh, obviously we, we do have some very small entrepreneurs in, in places like the Fifth Street Arcade, and the, the response that we got from some of them were, were, was essentially that, that because of COVID they couldn't afford it, and therefore, therefore their insurance has lapsed. Um, I would point out, though, that the, the majority of the people that we're working with uh, uh, do have insurance coverage. And uh, the one follow-up question is, uh, of the businesses that do have insurance, do, does their insurance cover this kind of loss in most cases, or, or in most cases... Uh, does it cover fire and, and natural disasters and, and such things, but does not cover this kind of loss? Um, Paul, uh, uh, to Councilman Miller, I, I think we're, what we're going to do through the application process is kind of look at, at each uh, applicant on a case-by-case -case basis. As you can appreciate, uh, insurance companies, uh, excuse me, insurance coverages vary. Um, but um, we're not necessarily hearing that there's widespread indication that the civil unrest is being rejected as, an, as, a, uh, as a claim in and of itself. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thank fur you. Further questions from our board? Uh, this is Nan Baker, if I may ask a question. Sure. Uh, I know some insurances uh, and, you know, I've had experience with um, coverage of, of different retail spaces. The glass, the uh, exterior glass is typically uh, not covered by um, insurances. I'm not quite sure why they don't cover the exterior glass, but that does seem to always be an exemption. Have you found that to be um, in some of the um, insurances that you've seen? Um. Council, uh, Councilperson Baker, yeah, we, we are experiencing uh, some of the, again, the discussions we're having. Again, we'll clarify that through the application process, but yes, we are seeing some instances where that's not covered, and we are seeing some nuances to that. For example, uh, the way the leases are structured in the Fifth Street Arcades, um, the, uh, clearly the retailer, in, the internal retailers were responsible for that damage. Uh, and again, because some of them are so small, that uh, that creates a hardship, obviously. Yes, thank you. If I can follow up, um, I see that in, in your response, which I appreciate you responding to each of the questions, it's um, payable perhaps to either the landlord or tenant or both, depending on the insurances and what's covered. Um, is that your intent, that it could be either the landlord or the tenant? Uh, perhaps the landlord for exterior damage and the tenant for interior damage? Is that the thought process? Well, I, again, as, as we look at each applicant, we will look at um, how, those, those, how the responsibility is, is um, um, created by the lease, uh, and then, again, look at insurance to see what's covered and what isn't covered. So um, although I think in the majority of instances we would work with the small business owner, um, you know, in some instances, we, we, we do know that there may be uh, the property owner who may not be responsible for, as you pointed out a few minutes ago, to, uh, to replace the glass. Right. Okay. And um, just for clarification, if there is insurance coverage, uh, either by the landlord or tenant, but there's gap that is not covered, say a deductible, or um, perhaps there's just different things that aren't covered by insurance, even though they have it, are those also items that they can uh, apply for some assistance? Um, uh, uh, Council, uh, Councilwoman uh, Baker, yes, th those are the types of things we, we would like to use the money surgically for, not to replace insurance, but to, uh, to augment where there are gaps in the insurance. Right. All right. Um, if I may, just, just one last. I see you have quite uh, a few, which is wonderful to see, of organizations that are um, contributing towards this cause. Do you feel at this point with um, all the different entities that are contributing that we will be able to um, overcome what is needed with your 1.5 to 3.5 million in damage? 
Um, uh, Councilwoman Baker, we, we, we do think uh, with all the partners at the table, we should be, we should be able to have the resources uh, to help um, all the applicants. Uh, as of this morning, um, we have 38 applicants in the system. Um, and that might grow as the week goes on. But, but again, we, we do think that given the resources and the amount of damages, uh, by the way, uh, the damages are still being calculated by the applicants. We should be able to have enough resources to help them. If I may, just one last question, because um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in this. The um, businesses that have um, uh, you know, gotten the loans or needed to do what they needed to do in order to reopen, would this perhaps be a request to reimburse them for what they've paid uh, or, or not? I mean, these businesses are losing money every day that they're not open uh, and are trying to do their best to do so. Um, Councilwoman Baker, we would use these funds uh, only to document the damages from uh, the civil unrest of May 30th and, and the subsequent days. We would not look to um, reimburse any businesses for COVID-related COVID-19 related uh, damages, which as you know, are there are different sources of financing that are trying to help with those. Yes, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. If a store owner oh. or landlord may fix his glass and um, allow that business to reopen because they are able to do that, would you reimburse that landlord for what they may have paid out of their pocket as if it wasn't covered by insurance? Meaning, if there was a gap between the, if, with the landlord's insurance. Yes. Well, anyone's anyone's insurance. Let's say that there was a gap of coverage for the glass. The glass may have cost one store owner a thousand dollars to replace, and he only got eight hundred of that. He has a two hundred dollar gap, but he already paid the entire two hundred and received. Would you reimburse him that two hundred dollars, even though? It's, it's been done. Um, uh, Councilwoman, I, I, I would envision, as you've described it, that yes, we would be able to su support that 200,000, or excuse me, 200,000, the $200 uh, investment that the, uh, that the company went ahead, and the small business went ahead and made in order to get the uh, glass installed. Okay, that's, um, that's, that's good to know, because these, are, these may be after the fact reimbursements as business owners are trying to hurry up and get back open again. Thank you that for your, your answers. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further questions from the board on this item? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Trevor. Sure. I can Trevor. follow up from yes. Councilman Baker. Yes. Uh, good morning, Joe. Thanks for joining us today. Just a question on the uh, what Councilman Baker was asking. If <clears throat> uh, a owner... Um, does it, even with or without insurance, but pays that thousand dollars for the window, um, th they're eligible for reimbursement even though they already covered that expense. Is that correct? That that uh, we would envision that they would be eligible. Correct. Uh, again, as long as the expense was related to the civil unrest of the 30th, and they may have had to make a decision uh, to go forward with replacing the glass. And do we have an estimated amount? of requests from, I believe you said, 38 applications so far? Um, at this point, um, I believe we had 20 some, uh, 25 or 26 at the end of last week. That totaled, um, I think, around $300,000. I do not have the um, request number for the 38 as of this morning, unfortunately. That'll work. Thank you, Joe. And then do we know, um, is there a cap on the city of Cleveland money per business? I thought I read that there was where it will only cover up to 25% of the damage per business, but I don't know if that's accurate or not. Is there a cap on the million dollars that the city of Cleveland is putting in? Uh, I apologize for not having it in front of me, but I believe, uh, yes, there is a cap, uh, and it does relate to a, a, a smaller uh, a smaller. Um, request and then a slightly larger request. And I think it could be from five to 25, but it is capped at the 25%, yes. Okay. And what are, are the other funds such as the county money or GCP, uh, DCA, or even Cleveland Foundation, will that be capped at the 25% as well, or will there not be a cap with that money? 
Um, I don't believe there, there will be a cap, but, but again, we're, what we're looking to do is, is um, uh, what I would d describe as through our loan process, through our loan committee, we will, uh, no, excuse me, loan, our, our grant application process will uh, essentially mix and match appropriate um, sums of money for each applicant. So um, we, you know, we don't, uh, at this, we haven't necessarily set a cap, but we obviously want it to help as many businesses as possible. So we'll obviously go through an underwriting to make sure that we are doing that. And then are we, with, with the money, are we covering any stolen property from any of these businesses or is this only damage, actual physical damage to the property? Well, I think if there was a business loss to looting, um, I think that that would be part of um, the damages that we would consider. Again, subject to insurance coverage. And does that include uh, bars as well or restaurants that got impacted if uh, any alcohol and stuff was stolen? Um, I believe that, that it would. And do we know who's going to make up the committee for the review process? Yeah, actually, um, um, we would have a, 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 at least one staff person from each organization providing um, uh, support. Um, Paul, I know, uh, forgive me, I don't remember Jan's last name, but uh, my understanding is Jan, uh, one of the economic development staff, will, will represent the county. Um, there'll be DCA staff, uh, GCP staff, um, there'll be Cleveland Foundation staff, and there'll be... Um, uh, City of Cleveland staff as well. That's correct. And I would add um, to the board that an additional responsibility of our staff will be ensuring that anything that's paid with county funds is uh, strictly in compliance with the county's wishes. Even if the committee has a different thought, they would have to use another funding source if they want to do something beyond what the county wants to do. And that's uh, and just to augment what Paul said, that that would be our understanding as well. Do we have an estimate, uh, and maybe we can't say that right now, but how much we requested from the Cleveland Foundation? Um, we have a request, um, and uh, we understand that uh, they will be reviewing the request at their board meeting on Thursday, the 25th. So we, we should know by Thursday? Correct. Okay. And then just in terms of the reduction of the dollar amount, um, the intent behind uh, that request, and I appreciate uh, the board's consideration on that, uh, is just uh, that uh, the board of control or, or council can kind of review how this initial process will go, and as additional funds are needed, that's something that I think uh, at least the county council would uh, consider uh, at a future board of control meeting. So I appreciate the willingness to uh, reduce it to $100,000. Thank you for clarifying that. We appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Chair, may, if I may ask a question, Nan Baker. Sure, Nan, proceed. I just want to put on for the record, um, because this is a lot of money and it's a very important initiative, and I sincerely appreciate uh, what you're doing, but we are not going to be um, assisting banks or insurance companies or Starbucks or the Indians or the casino. We are specifically going to address small business owners um, and minority and female owned businesses. We really are going to be targeting, not even just with the county 100,000, but overall is, that is the intent overall for the dollars being spent. Am I correct to say that? That is absolutely correct. And thank you for, uh, for mentioning that, uh, 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 Councilwoman uh, Baker. Well, I, I appreciate your work on this and uh, certainly will support it. Can, can I ask a follow-up question to that, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, proceed, Mr. sure. Trevor. Uh, I, so I, I just, are, are the larger corporations, as the councilwoman just pointed out, won't be eligible for these funds, or are they just taking kind of a, a second priority with these funds? I just want to make well, a get clarification on that. Well, again, we do not anticipate... Um, uh, for example, the casino uh, sustained damage. We, we do not anticipate that the casino will be an applicant for these funds. Why not? Pardon? What? 
what 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 if they do though, or, or what if uh, the Indians are? I mean, are, how how would we treat them? Well, again, we, we, we're clearly, I think the partners in this are clearly stating that our significant priority is going to be on the small locally owned businesses that, that, that I think you guys have articulated. Um, you know, I would suggest if there is a demand beyond that, then, then we will literally come back to the, 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 uh, the partners uh, and have a conversation about that. But at this point, we believe that there's significant enough demand uh, and uh, the to match the resources that we have for the small business sector that we're, that we're describing. Okay, and then last question: Will these um, will these awards to these small businesses will there be a, a public report uh, reporting structure on who got what and how much? Um, yeah, we would. We definitely would envision working with uh, with Paul, for example, as well as the city uh, and our other partners to to be transparent and to have those uh, uh, have that information available. Uh, and again, we would uh, obviously make it available within the um, parameters that uh, the department and the the county would like to see as well. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no further questions, uh, I will make a motion to approve this item. Oh boy. Here we go. Who just put us on mute? Yeah. Mr. Marquardt, do you want a second that or is that what you said? Can everyone here still? Uh, Mr. Marquardt seconded my motion. Uh, I, I, I can't hear it. That's better. Oh. No, the music is still going. I don't hear it. No. It's loud. It is. Uh, please, please do not put us on hold. Uh, you just caused a delay in our meeting, whoever that was. So with that being said, everyone, please mute, but do not put us on hold. Uh, we are going to make a motion to approve this item. Is there a second? Second. This is Trevor Uh Mr. Councilman Miller, uh, second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, item approved. Next item. And the item is being approved as Mr. amended. Mr. Chair, can I just ask one? It, that was for 100000 correct? I just want to make sure. That yes, 100000 right Okay, thank, yeah. thank you. Okay. Before we move on to the next item, I just want to state that we're having technical difficulties uh, regarding our monitors. Uh, so you will not be viewing, uh, as we're streaming live, you will not be viewing the agenda. Moving on to the next item, item number BC 2020-348, Department of Development, recommending an award on a purchase order and enter into an agreement with the County Planning Commission in the amount not to exceed $60,000 for planning activities and technical assistance for the period April 1st, 2020, and the end time period is being amended to reflect March 31st, 2022. Good morning, this is Sarah Park Jackson with the Department of Development. This is our annual um, award to the Planning Commission to assist us with our federal um, grant fundings and the requirements thereof. We decided to do a two-year award instead of a one-year award because HUD is coming forward with various things through the year we've determined that we need to act upon and therefore we won't have a gap um, in service if we do a two-year agreement. So it's an agreement for $30,000 for the first 12 months and then $30,000 for the second month. Um, the planning, condition, planning Commission does our map for us uh, as required by HUD to determine our low to moderate income areas as well as environmental reviews that are required for our CDBG Muni Grant Awards and um, other federal activities we undertake. 
Okay, thank you, thank Sarah. You. Are there any questions from the board on this item? Hearing none, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? This is Dale. I'll second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item. And the item is approved as amended. As amended. Yep. Next item. Item number BC 2020-349, Department of Information Technology, submitting amendments to a contract with Infor Public Sector, Inc. for information technology services and solutions. And it's for the Enterprise Resource Planning System for the period October 27, 2016 through October 26, 2021, to modify the scope of services effective June 1, 2020, and for additional funds in the total amount not to exceed $223,042.50. Scope modifications are as follows. Amendment number 53, to provide strategic sourcing and contract management training classes for end users on the rollout of new modules related to procurement in the amount not to exceed $66,240. Amendment number 54, creation of a custom interface between on-base and strategic sourcing and contract management modules to allow for automatic exporting of documents from the enterprise resource planning system to the agenda manager slash document storage in on-base in the amount not to exceed $105,052.50 and amendment number 55, provide additional training on modules for fiscal office staff in the amount not to exceed $51,750. Good morning, Janelle Green, Department of IT. Um, thank you, Andrea, for reading all of that into the record. Um, we did answer some advanced questions um, from council in relation to these items. Um, these change orders uh, were part of the, um, the new allocation request that was submitted this year. So um, these were included in advance um, reports and requests that we submitted before. Um, um, beyond that, I, I will take any questions, and, and also Jack Ryan is on the line to take any uh, quest further questions um, from Council. Thank you, Janelle. Are there any questions from the board members? Yes, uh, Janelle. This, this is Dale. And uh, my question is uh, I got the, the impression from the answers that these items fall within the, uh, the current project budget and does not increase the project budget. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, Jack, did you want to handle that or did you want me to? Yeah, um, this is uh, Jack Ryan, uh, Program Manager for ERP. Uh, the, these items were the items that have been briefed and were included in our, in our budget forecast uh, in our, our last briefing, I believe it's, I believe we've uh, been both uh, in some sep in, in individual meetings, uh, in roundtable meetings, as well as the last uh, finance committee uh, official briefing for ERP status. So they have been included. They're the three items that that were included on on those briefs. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Are there further questions? Hearing none, then? Trevor, I just want to say thank, thanks for the answers. They, they were helpful. Oh, very good. Okay, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? This is Dale. Second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item, please. Next Thank item, you. item number BC 2020-350, Department of Information Technology, submitting an amendment to a contract with Harris, McKessie, and Brennan, Inc., doing business as HMB for maintenance and software support on the Right Fax Enterprise Fax Manager server. It's for the period June 1, 2017 through May 31, 2020, to extend the time period to May 31st, 2021, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $19,216.29. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, Janelle Green, Department of IT. Um, this uh, contract amendment is the combination of two um, agreements we had. One, uh, we had the agreement with uh, HMB for Right Fax Services. And uh, we had another agreement with Toshiba, uh, which, as you recall, was our former um, printer and copier servicer. So what we did was um, to transition those licenses over to HMB uh, for management of one contract. Um, we do have some agencies, because I believe this was a question when we presented this last time, you know, why are we uh, retaining back services? Um, we do have some agencies that do require uh, fax services, a lots of H HS um, agencies, and then with state and federal agencies do require faxing um, back and forth. So that's why we do have those, as well as having um, a secure fax for uh, submission of documents to HR. So we do have those uh, licenses, and, and we do need to have those um, for uh, county staff use. Okay, thank you. Are there questions from the board on this item? Hearing none, I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? This is Trevor, second. Seconded by Mr. Mackler. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item, please. Next item. Thank item. you. Next item, item number BC 2020-351, Department of Human Resources, submitting an amendment to a contract with the Jellyvision Lab, Inc. for Alex Virtual Benefits Counselor Software Subscription Services for Cuyahoga County Employee Benefits Open Enrollment. It's for the period July 22nd, 2019 through October 7th, 2020, to extend the time period to October 7th, 2021, and for additional funds, in the amount not to exceed $132,972. Good morning, I'm Pat Smock on behalf of the Department of Human Resources. This amendment would add a second year to the Alex Virtual Benefits Tool contract. Uh, this tool allows employees to go online, enter information regarding their circumstances, and the tool walks them through the benefits options for the employee and their family. Um, it can be used year-round, but it's most beneficial during open enrollment and during the enrollment period for new hires. During the first year of their contract, there were over 3,000 visits to the site. Uh, over 400 new hires visited the site as well. The average time spent using the tool is about 9.6 minutes. 81% uh, reported a better understanding of their benefits options after using the tool, and 90% of the visitors reported that it was helpful when choosing their benefits. Uh, 311 employees changed their benefits from 2019 to 2020. We did have a question about the impact of the tool on those changes, and unfortunately we can't be sure that those changes are due to the Alex tool. But it does appear that the goal of employees increasing their understanding of the county benefits programs was achieved. This is uh, the same cost as the first year of the program. There was an additional question about this term being one year versus the previous first year being 15 and a half months. That really included the signature period uh, prior to the go-live uh, service period of the plan. So actually the service period of each plan each year is one year. Uh, we did respond to several additional questions from the board members. We do apologize that those questions responses were slightly tardy. And we do appreciate the board's consideration of this request. Thank you, Pat. Are there any questions from the board on this item? Um, Ann Baker, just one question. Sure. Was there a request um, by the employees stating that they were having difficulty that prompted us to um, um, engage with this uh, new program? Council, when the original engagement was honestly due to the fact that one of our uh, HR, HR staff members here had a spouse whose company uh, utilized this tool, so the HR staff member utilized the tool, thought it would be beneficial to the employees as a learning tool, and brought it to, to our attention. So no, no, no direct request from the employees. It just thought that it would be a good additional tool for employees to increase their knowledge of the plans that are offered to them. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Further questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Trevor, second. Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Item approved. Next item.
Next item, item number BC 2020-352, Fiscal Office, Department of Consumer Affairs, submitting an amendment to a contract with Nover Ingolstein and Associates, Inc. for support and maintenance on the WinWAM software system. It's for the period February 1st, 2018 through January 31st, 2021 to extend the time period to January 31st, 2022 and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $5,010. Hi, this is Cheryl Harris from Consumer Affairs. And this uh, WinWAM software is our, um, it, it's the software that we use to perform weights and measures uh, tests in the field. Um, all the inspectors use it. It allows us to, um, to go through with efficiency and any time Anytime any NIST standards or state standards uh, change, those are automatically updated in the system so that we stay current with testing procedures and requirements. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Cheryl. Are there any questions from the board? Um, Mr. Chair, this is Trevor. Just to confirm from the advanced questions and answers, it looks like there is a plan to go out to bid right next year um, after this contract, it looks like. Yeah, and we believe that they're a sole source provider, but we just, and, and we do periodically look to see if anything else is in use by, um, you know, other jurisdictions, um, but just to be, you know, just in case there's something that we have no clue about, we're going to, we'd like to throw it out for bid just to see if there's another system, but we're really happy with this contractor. They're very responsive to us and they work very well with our IT department. Um, and they've made changes to their system, sometimes at our request, you know, because we felt we needed a feature, they've added it. They're a pretty responsive contractor, and we were very happy with the system. But, yeah, we'll throw it out there Thank for you. a bit. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Hearing none, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Mr. Trevor, second. Mr. Dale, second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item. Next item, item BC 2020-353, Department of Health and Human Services, Community <laughs> Initiatives Division, Family and Children First Council, submitting an amendment to an agreement with East Cleveland City School District for implementation of the school-based, community-based Closing the Achievement Gap program. For the period July 31st, 2018 through December 31st, 2019, to extend the time period to December 31st, 2021, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $191,900. Good morning, Kathleen Johnson from Family for the First Council. This is for closing the achievement gap program. This program is to identify 9th to 12th graders who are in danger of failing with risk factors of who have failed two or more classes, who are absent 36 or more days, who have um, disciplinary problems or suspensions, who have been um, held back a grade level. Um, there's an intensive in school um, intervention program with credit retention, a linkage coordinator, um, and community resources and services and college exposure trips. Um, I know there were um, a lot of questions that County Council and had, had had, so I did respond by email. Um, so if there's any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Kathleen. Are there any questions from our board on, the, on this item? <laughs> okay, hearing Hi. none. Hi, yes, this is Dale. Sure, Dale. And uh, I'd just like some discussion as to uh, why this took so long in getting to us and whether that has any impact on, on services being provided or paid for. Um, yes, yeah, so um, Councilman Cheryl Stevens had some questions about this particular contract um, because it is in her district. Um, so she wanted to review it. So there was a delay there. Um, 
with N4 being um, newly implemented at the beginning of the year, um, our office had some distinct problems with N4 um, with us not being set up correctly. I am the only person who was able to enter any other contract. And then when COVID hit, it got even worse. Um, I had about a month or so where I couldn't even access N4. Um, so that was a major delay in why it's being brought so late. And then even working from home, it just, I had a lot of, a lot of problems, which I have gotten worked through. Um, but I even had to go downtown like twice to work out of OPD to get everything submitted and taken care of. Um, so these are actually these next three contracts are our last contract that would be late. Um, so we won't have this problem anymore. And I'm versed in, in four now and I'm pushing things through um, much quicker now. Um, services were started. Um, we did have conversations with the district um, about the contract not being approved as of yet. So they were aware of everything. So in the response to the advance question, it says no payments have been made to the district, but payments have been made on behalf of the program. Can you explain that last part of what you mean by payments have been made on behalf of the program? So yes, there is a um, program manager, um, Students of Promise, so there might have been some payments either, well, no, not to him for this contract, but I mean, if uniforms were purchased, if um, the district had to pay for it, if a field trip was had, um, if there were any activities that the school participated in before the schools were shut down, if a vendor had submitted a payment to the school, the school would have made the payment and then we would have reimbursed them for those payments. So uh, I'd like to add, I'd like to, I'd like to add, to add this in spite of not having a contract. Is that what you're saying? I'd, I'd like to answer. This is Robin Martin, Family and Children First Council. So this is this contract is a continuation. And so each one of the requirements for the closing the achievement gap program is that each school has a linkage coordinator. And because that person is employed by the district, typically when these amendments are in place, they keep their linkage coordinator in place. So what they do when they know a contract is pending, they minimize any other costs that they are spending related to the contract. But because the majority of the contract is the, the, um, the payment for the linkage coordinator, they are using funds because we, we're paying for that staff person. But they kept their trips and all of that at a, at a bare minimum, if they did any. We have not received any billing from them at this point. So, uh, so we have not made any, any payments for 2020 so far, is that what you're saying? Correct, we have not. Okay, thanks. Any further questions from the board on this item? Uh, this is Van Baker. Uh, just one question. Proceed, sure. Uh, we have had in the past where uh, it seemed like the breakdown happened when only one person knew how to do a task. And uh, that's not a good way to run a department. If you were to leave or get sick or something should happen, uh, how would things proceed? Do you have, is there a, 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 a policy in place that if you were not able to do this task that someone else is trained to do that? Uh, so this Actually, will... Council. Yes, go Actually, ahead. Actually, Councilwoman Baker, we have three people who are ready to go, but Kathy is the only one whose system we could get to work during this COVID crisis. Okay, so it's, okay, so it's more of a technical problem not a skill problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Trevor, did you have to add something? Yeah, re real quick, Mr. Chair. Um, Robin or Kathleen, um, it, I don't know where we ended up with this, but is the do we know if the East Cleveland City School District, are they using Students of Promise? Or are they going to potentially use a different vendor? Did, 
where was that? They are not you. They are not using students to promise. Okay, thank you. Are they are they're they just doing it internally? Do you know? Um, are yeah. they using some? They're doing it internally. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, hearing no further questions, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second, Mr. Mr. Dale. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item, item number BC 2020-354, Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Family and Children First Council, recommending an award on a purchase order and enter into an agreement with Bedford City School District in the amount not to exceed $110,950 for implementation of the school-based, community-based Closing the Achievement Gap Program. And it's for the period March 6, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Hi, Kathleen Johnson, Family of Children First Council. This is for Closing the Achievement Gap, um, which is the same program um, as previous items for East Cleveland, but this is for the Buffalo City School District. This is a new contract um, with Buffalo City School District. Um, the reason why this one is late, in addition to the other reasons as previous stated, um, there was contract negotiations going on with the superintendent with um, Bedford um, with some of the contract language. Um, and the, if there was any other questions that um, council had in regard to um, the reason why it was submitted late, Please let me know. Does the uh, board have any questions on this item? Uh, this is Nan Baker. I just have one question. Sure, Nan. Definitely. Uh, understanding that this was delayed because of contract negotiations, would it have been better that we started this contract later then instead of 3-6 and begin it when it actually did get agreed upon? Councilwoman, um, the, the, the issue with the contract was with legal around the indemnification clause because the school is a political subdivision and they were able to um, work that out with the district's attorney in March. Okay. So as of 3-6, we did have an agreement in place. I would have to go back and check to see when the actual signed document came to us because I'm not sure on 3-6 if it had actually gone before their board. I need. I would have to check the actual date. Okay. I, I, it, I you know, it's one thing to have a technical error, I guess, or, or difficulty, but I think it's another that we didn't have the contract ready to go at the date that we're asked to approve. Um, well, so if, if I could interject, ma'am, um, sure. we got sent home on March 17th, and that's when I started having all the, the technical difficulties with an M4 had just gotten set up, and then I couldn't start working in M4 from home right away. Yeah. And we, we did technical. share with the district that this, we did share with, this, this, with the district that this date might be a problem. Okay. Um, I, I'm looking at well, the date that you signed it. Um, it's not an actual date on here, but I know we didn't get this from them until March. Until March. And, and March 3-6, you were still in place at the county. Um, right, but we have to get other documents from them as well. Like until we get all the documents, we don't start the submission into M4. Okay, so even though this is dated 3-6, it was inevitable that this contract would have been given to us late. Probably so, yes ma'am. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions from the board? 
Hearing none, I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? This is Dale. I'll second. Seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item. Next item, item BC 2020-355, Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Family and Children First Council, submitting an amendment to a contract with Values in Action Foundation for Workforce Training Services for Youth, and it's for the period March 7th, 2018 through December 31st, 2019, to extend the time period to December 31st, 2021, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $105,000. Good morning, Kathleen Johnson, Family and Children First Council. This is a contract amendment for Values in Action um, Project Love. They do um, workforce training for youth for our agency. They provide and coordinate services within the community in two school districts right now with South Euclid Lyndhurst and with John Adams High School in the Cleveland Municipal School District. Um, they currently serve 50 students within South Euclid Lyndhurst School District and 40 students at John Adams. They provide workforce training. They provide soft skills, positive team role models some field trips and interview and interviews for in for internship and job training. Um, we did send responses to um, the council. So if you have any more questions, please let me know. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Mr. Trevor, second. Seconded by Mr. McAleer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item. Next item, BC 2020-356, Department of Health and Human Services, Community Initiatives Division, Office of Early Childhood, recommending a payment on a purchase order to City of Cleveland, Department of Public Health, in the amount not to exceed $323,999.83, to pay final invoices for services rendered in connection with an agreement for administration and coordination for expansion of the Moms First program in connection with the Invest in Children program for the months of September through December 2019. Good morning, this is Rebecca Dorman from Invest in Children Office of Early Childhood. Um, this is a situation and I'm happy to say the last time you'll be hearing about um, this type of thing where unfortunately um, OVM under former leadership had prematurely uh, decertified contract and funds for a contract in which we knew we would have additional charges. So um, with this item um, and with your approval, we'll finally be able to settle all of um, that situation and uh, move on. And happy to take your questions and both Bob, Dave and Marcos Cortez are with us as well. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board on this item? Okay, hearing none, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Trevor, second. Uh, Lee, Lee beat you there. Uh, seconded by Lee Tucker. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Item approved. Next item. Next item, item BC, item BC 2020 357, Cuyahoga Job and Family Services, recommending an award on a purchase order and enter into an agreement with Ohio Attorney General, care of Treasurer, State of Ohio, Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigations, in the amount not to exceed $212,100 for access to the National Web Check Program for criminal background checks for various departments. And it's for the period June 1st, 2020 through May 31st, 2023. Good morning, this is Chris Alexander. On behalf of Cuyahoga Job and Family Services, um, we are requesting to enter into a new agreement with the Ohio Attorney General's Office to perform background checks for multiple county departments. Um, this new agreement would run through May 31st of 2023. 
Um, the Ohio Attorney General's Office, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, processes all um, background checks and FBI checks and fingerprints for the state of Ohio um, through their web check services. Um, currently, these background checks are part of the Cuyahoga Job and Family Services OWF application process, as well as the Job and Family Services Work Experience Program. Um, in addition, our um, HR department uses these background checks for the hiring of new county employees. Yeah. And new this year, um, for the Office of Child Support Services, the notaries in the Child Support Services Office are now required to get a background check when renewing their notary license. So um, that department is new this year. Um, the State of, um, of Ohio Attorney General's Office is the sole source to process these fingerprints. Um, we did submit responses to advanced questions last week. Um, no services have been performed. Um, the end of the contract on May 31st, and no invoices have been paid since May 31st. I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you, Chris. Are there questions from the board on this item? Okay, uh, hearing none, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, I'll second. Uh, okay, seconded by Councilman Miller. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, item approved. Next item. Next item, item BC 2020-358, Office of the Medical Examiner, recommending a sole source award on a purchase order to Justice Tracks Inc. in the amount not to exceed $35,100 for three two-day training sessions for six laboratory staff on the use of Crystal Reports software. And it's for the period June 30th, 2020 through July 29th, 2020. Good morning, this is Hugh Shannon from the Medical Examiner's Office. Uh, we are finishing up our um, upgrade of our Justice Tracks system, which tracks uh, evidence and reports uh, from the uh, crime lab. Uh, the Crystal Reports um, software is an add-on that allows the labs to produce their reports. Um, and so we are having uh, these trainings um, for key staff in each of the labs, and then those key staff will help train uh, the rest of the uh, laboratory staff. Okay. And this is uh, Crime Lab uh, from the Crime Lab Fund. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Are there any questions from the board members on this item? Hearing none, I will make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second, this is Dale. Seconded by Councilman Miller. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item approved. Next item. Moving Thank on you. moving on to the consent agenda, item numbers BC 2020 359 through 365. If any of the board members have any questions, uh, we'll give it a minute. Please speak out. This is Dale, and I'll move for approval on the consent agenda items. Okay, it's moved. I will Trevor, second. second. Okay, moved by Councilman Miller, seconded by Trevor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the consent agenda has been approved. Moving on, additional business. We do not have any additional business. Is there public comment at this time? Public comment once, twice, no public comment. Uh, with that being said then, uh, I will make a motion. Andrea. Oh, yes. Andrea. Yes. Uh, the, this is Dan Basta. Are the items, were they on the consent agenda? Yes, they are. They have been, they're getting ready. They have been approved. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure. Okay. Uh, with that being said, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Lee Tucker. All those in favor say aye. 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 It's okay. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>